morning, everyone. Welcome to today's live case entitled Meet the Experts in Fenestrated Endovascular Aortic Repair, Commented Live Case and Update on Bridging Stents. My name is Tara Mastracci. I'm coming to you from sunny London. Uh, I'm a vascular surgeon at St. Bartholomew's Hospital in London, and I am delighted today to be joined by Professor Timothy Resch, Professor of Vascular Surgery at Copenhagen University. Good morning, Mr. Resch. Good morning, uh, Tara. Also, uh, equally hello from a beautifully uh, sunny Copenhagen. I'm viewing over to my home country in Sweden on the other side of the of the sound and looking forward to this very exciting case. It's good to be here with you today. Well, welcome. We're also delighted to be joined by Professor Eric Verhoeven, vascular surgeon at the General Hospital in Nuremberg. And in a, about an hour or so, Professor uh, Stefan Hallon, head of uh, vas de Department of Aortic and Vascular Surgery at Hôpital Marie Lalonde in Paris. Um, before we start, I'd like to quickly remind ourselves of the agenda for today. We're going to have a brief introduction, which is happening now, and then we're going to be introduced to the case by Professor Verhoeven. Um, we're going to be watching the case and uh, hopefully getting some good commentary and taking a lot of questions from the audience. Uh, and then Professor Stéphane Hallon will give us a brief um, overview of his experience with stent graphs, uh, and then we'll uh, take any other audience questions. I, our learning objectives uh, are going to come up on the screen next. Learning objectives are to have a look at a case uh, over the shoulder of a high volume center, um, to have live interactions with endovascular experts com commenting on the case, to learn the steps in planning, sizing, positioning of bridging stents in FIVAR, mm -hmm. and uh, to get up-to-date and midterm results of bridging stents in FIVAR. Um, a lot of things to cram into just a couple of hours on a Tuesday morning. I'd like to remind you that today's session is interactive. So if you have any questions, we really want to hear from you. Um, please put them to the faculty and submit them in the form on the webpage and we'll address, address them as soon as we see them. Um, from a beginning point of view, uh, we have a couple of minutes before we meet uh, Professor Verhoeven in the operating room. Uh, so Professor Rush, tell me, what are the things that you start thinking about before we get into uh, a case, a fenestrated case on a day like today? I think that in my mind, uh, I think that and we can agree upon that a lot of the planning uh, or a lot of the preparation for, for one of these cases is actually done in the planning room before the case. I would say about 80% of the case is done. So if you've done your planning properly, you're, uh, you, you're off to a good start when you perform these cases in the operating room. Uh, and of course, uh, in contrast, if you pa uh, plan poorly, uh, you're going to suffer from a really long day in the operating room and might suffer the consequences at the end of the day. So I think planning is, is really key. And that goes for, for uh, obviously, uh, planning and mapping uh, the main components of the device, as well as choosing the appropriate ancillary uh, uh, equipment and, and stents that you need during the procedure. So I think those, those are the key com components in my mind to make this successful. What do you usually yeah, do? Yeah, I couldn't agree uh, more. Yeah, same thing. And that means before a case starts, sometimes weeks before a case, when you first meet the patient, going through consent, planning the devices you'll need and making sure your team is prepared uh, for all of the possible eventualities and having kind of ancillary equipment in the room. Uh, so all of that, I think, is necessary to have a successful fenestrated case. Um, I think also I wonder if, these, we... if I could just add, I think also during these cases, yeah. uh, you mentioned it briefly, I think, the, the pre pre surgical prep with the team is is critical I think for for success if you especially if you don't do a lot of these cases to go through the whole procedure because there are a number of steps that you have to be familiar familiar with and it makes it easier if everybody's on board for what we're doing yeah absolutely we usually have a team huddle in the morning to make sure that even if a person isn't putting putting the stent in that they know um how it's going to be done and, and when in the procedure it's going to be done so it's uh, it's a good practice absolutely i wonder if we're ready for the case presentation uh of the case we're going to see today yeah yeah okay hello 
Do you hear me? Hi there. I do hear you. Welcome. Hello, everybody. Uh, Tara, I heard you discuss with Tim. And we just want to go through the case presentation. We already did some work. And actually, it's probably more important that we show you what we did. So do you see the slide? Yes. So Richard, could you please, uh, Horst, could you please go through? So this is the patient that we present today. And as usual, I like to show sagittal images because I pay a lot of attention to the sagittal images. And what you see, it's, uh, it's a nearly six centimeter aneurysm. And the arrow shows you that uh, this is not a good case for open surgery, or you would have to do probably a toraco type four repair. Uh, otherwise, without that dorsal bulge, we would probably have treated that patient by open means. He is not uh, without uh, comorbidity, as you can see in the image, but um, uh, the problem is that for endovascular is not ideal either. Please, next slide. And I will show you that uh, because the guy has uh, four renal arteries, two on the right and two on the left. And as you can see from the plan, we only have a four fenestrated graft. The reason is that on the right, it's really a very small second renal artery or accessory renal artery. On the left, and I will show you that, um, there are two, but Cook and I struggled to get the fenestrations, two six millimeter fenestrations in the correct position. Um, so finally, we decided that we would only do one renal artery on the left. So obviously, uh, we prepared the case, we deployed the graft. Um, and as I will show you from the angio, the right renal artery, the right renal artery uh, has um, a, a sharp takeoff. And the left renal artery is not ideal and a little bit behind the kink. So we decided very cautiously to also have an upper approach and an indwelling catheter in the left renal artery. In case we struggled with either of those renal arteries, we would be able to come from above. But as I will show you, we are already in the renal arteries and uh, we had no problem. So this is the plan with regard to the bridging stent grafts. They are all B grafts because fenestrations, uh, you can see the numbers there. And then uh, obviously we will finish with a bifurcated graft and a left iliac limb. So if we could move to one view maybe, and then demonstrate what we have done, Könntest du die Mosaik mal aufsetzen, Beate? Are you still with us? So I will show you. Absolutely. Tara or Tim? Okay. Yes, yes. Mal yes. Ganz nach oben, Beate. So I will show you the first angel. Yeah. So this is the first angel. And here you can see, actually, on the CT scan, the takeoff of the right renal artery looks sharper. On the angel, it's better. And on the left, you can already see the two renal arteries. Okay, the mosaic. So we will quickly go through. Eine um, runter, Beata. So this is where I catheterized uh, the right renal artery, the next Beata. So here you can see the little angel that we did next. And actually, the angle looks pretty acceptable with the rosin. I was a bit brutal there, so don't do that at home. Be more cautious with your rosin. Um, but more importantly, what you see is that the angle is fine and we should be able to get a six or seven French ADL in there. That's why it's um, Then, weiter, Beata, Mosaic, Mosaic wieder. Uh, then, yeah, die nächste unten links, unten links. So here you see. What we have, and you can see, you can appreciate that we have an indwelling catheter in that left renal artery, and you can see the two renal arteries that are really adjacent to each other. I could have said, I'm gonna put a fenestration and just don't do a stent, 
And this is maybe a point of discussion for Stefan, Tim, and Tara. Mosaic. And then I try to categorize one, the next day. Yeah. And I, I, I managed. So this is the categorization of the, the one. And then we did an angel mosaic. Yeah, yeah, that's the angel. Sorry, you can go. So this is the angel. And then we discussed here that we were probably in the slightly smaller of the two. I left the wire in it. And uh, then I, well, that's the, the other angel. Okay, the next one. I left the Rosen in there. Next one. And then I decided to catheterize the other archery through the same hole, so to speak. And you can see that the wire takes a different part. So we are in the other one. We couldn't follow with that relatively brutal uh, C1 catheter. We like to use the brutal one because it's easy for catheterization. But when the angle is bad, it doesn't work. So we did an angio, got back in with a wire and then advanced with a CXI catheter from Cook. And we just made it, you will see it hiccup a little bit on that entrance, but all through the same fenestration. In the meantime, we already removed the indwelling catheter deciding that we wouldn't need it and wouldn't need the upper approach. And then we decided that we would go for the lower one and we removed the wire in the upper renal artery. Uh, so this, this is the CXI and then uh, the Rosen coming in probably. So the change for stiffer wire. You, yeah, there is the wire. And then you can go on for the last one where we removed the wire in the upper renal artery. So we catheterized them both. Uh, and now we are just at this moment at the point to hopefully quickly catheterize the, um, the celiac trunk and the SMA. Let me, now that I'm here again, uh, introduce you my very original team, uh, because we have uh, visitors from Spain. We have Gonzalo Bueno from Barcelona, who is visiting us, and his chief, Peri Altamas, is with us this week. So Gonzalo is with us a month. And Pere is here for this week. And we have another four, four branch cases planned, uh, another one this afternoon and the next three days. So uh, Pere is with me. Pablo is my uh, Spanish colleague who works with me for a couple of years now. Manuela Wilhelm also with me for a couple of years. And the most important person in the room, uh, Sister Eva, who knows everything about everything we do and also takes care of my logistics. In addition to that, we are very fortunate to have Beata from the radiology, who is taking care of the fusion and everything. And she's got a, a younger lady with her that she's teaching uh, to do this. Now, you may see or may not see the fusion rings. Unfortunately, this didn't work very well. So we fused for the right renal yeah, artery, and we are not going to pay too much attention to the fusion for the, the SMA and the celiac. Okay, so let's see what we have. You've been busy this morning, Eric. Uh, we are fairly busy this week. As I say, we have six uh, complex cases planned, so we, we have something to do indeed. Very so, good Eric, can, it, can, I ask a, can I ask a question for you? Yes, please. So you have now three catheters. You have two wires in the catheter and the patient can just describe for the audience viewing what your approach is to that, to that point to get all these catheters in and what sheets do you use and, and uh, do you have ancillary sheets or, or how do you approach that when you do four fenestrated cases? Yeah, you, you know, I'm a bit different from, from, from not the rest, so to speak, but um, I always use an 18 French sheet and I, um, I do two at a time, which means that I put my guiding sheets 
in as late as possible. I didn't orient this perfectly, so it's in, in 90 degrees. The one is in 1145, the other one on 12 uh, screen. Uh, but uh, I will catheterize the four vessels first, and uh, then I will put in the sheets at that time. So here you clearly see that we are in a side branch, which happens a lot in the SMA. I may be already too low, so I will try to go down. That's another side branch. If not, we will do a little angel to see where the main stem is and to just a moment. So I never use bigger sheets, Tim. I will put in, uh, in this case, probably two six French sheets in the, in the, let me do a little angel here. Can we a quote an apnoe have, bitte? What about you, I Tim? I hope Do I'm not already a, a in 20 the French in the contralateral side. A little bit depends, depends on, uh, normally I use a 16 or an 18. Uh, if I don't have a preloaded system, uh, an alternate approach, mm -hmm. I, obviously I can go down even to a 12 or a 16, but I, I've come to the realization that usually Green. I agree there with Eric, I'll use an 18 French, 16 or 18 French on the contra side. There it is. bitte. The preloaded system lets you do that, which is uh, lovely. Yeah, yeah. Dieses Bild rüber. Now, we can't see Eric's fusion, but uh, so, Tim, in your experience, you how can. important if, is if fusion? Gonzalo gives you another, if Gonzalo gives you another screen, you could see the fusion too. But the uh, fusion oh, okay. well, didn't work well because of the additional renal arteries. So we were a bit stuck there. And I decided to plan it just for the right renal artery. What's the problem? Pablo, screen. Okay. So here I'm in the main, main branch. Uh, uh, I was too deep and I was already in a side branch which showed up the collaterals to the celiac artery. So for a second, I was worried that I was not in a good position, but I, I'm okay. So this is clearly the SMA and I will now put in the amplats. And this is the answer to Tim's question. I put in an amplats with a short floppy tip. I leave those in and I've never ever not make it to advance a sheet afterwards. So I will do the renals first, go out. And when I'm finished with the renals, I will advance an ANL sheet over uh, this amplats and then uh, finish the job. And can you so an amplats is a pretty, um, sorry, go ahead, Tim. I was just gonna ask Eric, so why, why that sequence? Why would you do the renals first and then the SMA and not choose another vessel? Or any well, I, 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 I keep flow in everything. So I don't put in my sheets and I know with an 18 French sheet, I can only use uh, two, two uh, guiding sheets. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so normally I, 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 totally, I, I totally agree with you. And I think I, I do it the same sequence. And the reason for me to do that is that usually when you have an amplets in the SMA, that position is very secure. So you have a stable wire and you can pass. Exactly. Whereas the renals usually have a, a little bit less supportive uh, position with the rosin and the short short uh, artery. So, so I agree with you completely. I think that's a good... Well, there are there are many ways to roam, but uh, I think <laughs> for a team, a team, it's important to have one standardized way, and and yeah. to stick to that. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and it works very well for us. I am uh, usually a, a big maniac in trying to keep every vessel open or the flow uh, there as long as possible. So. Okay. And I, I noticed that you've recently published about whether or not you stent the celiac. So would you say that you stent it every single time? Well, it's a very nice one, Tara, because I think this one could do without stenting the celiac. And actually, it's such an easy celiac that we will most probably stent it. Uh, but you have very ugly celiacs. Um, uh, I'm just going to do a little puff here. Okay, that's fine. Uh, flush, and then 
Uh, guys, if you're not happy with the cameras, we have Gonzalo outside that can rearrange the cameras or you can do it, I don't know. But uh, we've had a few cases like this one and, and you saw the sagittal image, Tara, where we really mm -hmm. think that celiac is absolutely not a risk of, of endoleak. And if the fenestration mm -hmm. is very near to the SMA fenestration, as in this case, well, there is a very, very low risk of, uh, um, of, uh, of problems and occlusion. Having said that, this one, this one is so easy that we are probably going to put in a, a stent. The other reason would be that yeah. this patient is, of course, included in the study uh, because Bentley is very good at trying to get uh, uh, official indication, on-label indication for the uh, B grafts and the B graft plus. So we are uh, leading the FIVA study with the B graft, and this patient is one of them. Screen. Uh, can yeah. So let's have a six French on the right renal artery wire. So now is the most crucial moment because once I have these two guiding sheets in, I'm relaxed. Talking to compressor bitte. Draht halten. So we will just insert. What about your comfort with leaving the celiac unstented, Tim? Do you um? Do you, have you changed your practice at all in the years? Yes, I always smile, uh, smile when I get that question because uh, it used to be heresy to have like unstented fenestrations. And I think that we discovered it the hard way. I think we had some, uh, some difficult celiacs when we were moving from two to three to subsequently four fenestrations. And we found ourselves struggling for a very long time. So sometimes you would just not, not finish them. And, and it turns out, that they actually did very well, very well without the stent. Uh, so, so then we've taken the approach that if it is very difficult, and as Eric's pointed out, we get a good seal, uh, we'll most often just leave it. Uh, and also, I, I know you you've published some data on on how that works with the SMA or with celiac artery stents and how well they do, how well they actually do when you stent them. And I think that maybe you could mention that or say something about your experience. Yeah, well, our series and the the French series from uh, Stefan published from Lille before he left there, uh, both showed that if you have a really uh, tight uh, celiac stenosis from the beginning, a stent isn't going to make that better, and it's just likely to occlude. Now, the interesting thing in all of the data is that there was really no clinical consequence to the celiac occlusion if you stented it or if you didn't. Um, so they're pretty silent events. They make your branch instability numbers look horrible, um, but they don't actually have any kind of impact on the patient. So I think, I think it's an important consideration when people are starting out designing devices because the knock-on effect that it has is it just makes the whole construct so much more stable. You're so much less likely uh, to develop, uh, you know, a type 1A endoleak if you actually do a four-vessel fenestrated instead of kind of skipping the, the celiac. And so people shouldn't shy away from a four-vessel fenestrated because there's a scary celiac there um, because the yes. overall the device will be more stable. Well, as long as it's a, a juxtarenal aneurysm where we have a good seal, of course. Uh, but, of course, Okay, yes, so yes. we are in with the sheets, which makes me feel good and we flush the sheets with cold saline and now what we're sheets going are those, to eric what sheets are what, you using uh this is six french anls both sides so which means that we need two balloons uh, 10 by 2 because in a six french you cannot reuse the 10 by 2 balloon in a seven french you can now usually when we do everything in in ap and we move the graft because I really believe a fenestrated graft should be moved towards each osteum to facilitate catheterization. And uh, before you go lateral, I always looked at my celiac fenestration and uh, uh, fenestration for the SMA are good, well oriented. So here actually we are fine because usually what I like to do is to push up the graft a little bit to keep it pushed up, you see here. So Pablo, if you could do that, then we're going to quickly open the diameter reducing ties, which is the golden ring, as you know, we can look at that 
Pablo is holding the graph nicely. And now we are quickly going to open top stands so that we can relax. Screen. So there we are fixed. And before, especially when I've moved a lot, before we open the distal end, we're really going to look at it because this is the moment to detorque it if necessary. And, and you can see if you turn it, you can torque this graph to the limit. And if this happens, well, it's easy at this moment to detorque it that it's nicely open. And it is here, so it's fine. So we can uh, deploy, so release the graph completely. So the distal attachment, you know that any cook graft has a distal attachment. Um, so now the graft is released. And as this is a graft, I didn't mention it, I'm sorry, without a top cap, it's just an olive screen. We will now go down uh, with the olive screen, screen, screen. So you see the olive common pair, you have all oh, your hands there, very important. Anytime we move downwards with a sheet or with an olive, the rest is very happy to go with it. So you can release it a little bit, Paolo, screen. We're going to go out of the graft first to make sure that we are out of the way. Okay. Eva, kannst du daran ziehen? Ich werde massieren. Yeah, screen. Screen, screen, screen. Okay, so the implication screen. of that olive is that you have no uncovered top stent. Um, exactly. Have you had to change your graft design at all because of that? Um, Tim, I know you use that too. Not really. Uh, I mean, uh, you decide on your landing zone and and uh, with the top stand, you have that in addition, which means uh, that you are a bit higher in the aorta, but without covering anything. So that's not a problem. Now, uh, I didn't show it, but uh, the, the, groins, the groins are percutaneous, so we're going to leave this sheet. We're going to leave that sheet uh, in the external iliac screen. And we're going to fix it. So we're going to go down a little bit more. That is fine. Pay on. Yeah. This is a good one. And now we are going to quickly uh, step. So the one thing I'm not going to do here, and it's open to discussion for you guys, when it's angulated in the proximal neck, sometimes I use this moment screen. To, to balloon my graft. And I don't think yes, here it's yes. necessary. Okay, so let's go. Yeah, I think also okay. Tara with these procedures, uh, I think it's Mary, you hold the rest now. Yes. some of the procedural okay. steps because there are quite a few, and introducing Bitte. a balloon and inflating it can also cause some risk during the procedure to dislocate. Yeah, no, that's true. Such. 
I'd say the biggest compelling reason is that I use preloaded for almost all the devices now. So uh, yeah, yeah. you just kind of really okay. can't. So maybe we're going to use a shorter one here. We don't want, well, I think the 28 will not make it till that branch. I like the 28s. I don't know about you, but I, I really quite often like to use the 28 uh, stat graphs. What about you, Tara? Oh, 100%. The, uh, the variety of lengths in the Bentley uh, line of stent graphs is the reason why I favor Bentley. Uh, I think the 28 is the gorgeous length. It reminds I, me of the old days, the Joe Med stent days, yeah. <laughs> um, and they're, yeah. they're, they're with the same length. So, um, yeah, don't talk, definitely. Don't talk like that. Uh, you are still very young. <laughs> I don't think so, Eric. I think I agree with the 28, but I think for me, it's particularly useful for the SMA where that, you know, the, the yeah. varying lengths have really helped us with the SMA stents uh, as opposed to what we used to have for breaching stents, because now uh, we used to end up in fixed lengths that were either too long or too short, having to use additional stents to bridge over uh, uh, various uh, angled anatomies. But now with the, with these increasing number of four vessel designs, the, the, the shorter lengths and both celiac and particularly SMA, I think, are very useful. The 28 is a is a great, it's the sweet spot for the SMA stent, really. Yeah, I completely agree with you. I barely ever use a second bridging stent in the, in the SMA anymore. So the, the 28s have made a world of difference, which has cost implications when you're working in a public health care system. You don't want to have to use two stents instead of one. Absolutely. Well, we, yeah. we, we, we never do that for sure. Okay, I'm holding the wire in sight and keeping the stent on traction to avoid it jumping forward. Pablo, can we, don't do anything, Manu. Bitte nicht drauflegen. Uh, sorry, but so we, um, okay, so. I wonder if uh, we couldn't change the an angio video we're seeing because there's some black lines across it, or is that, uh, is that actually in the patient? That's the wires. Or what oh. do you mean? I, black squares I, I know right across see. the fenestrations. There are black squares on the image. Yeah, ah, we do. Why don't we go back to the old image, the non-fusion image? It was better. Ah, uh, Gonzalo. Thank you. Knock on the door. Sorry. Ah, much Gonzalo. better. Gonzalo. Oh, oh uh, there we go. Better, better. better, uh, Richard, better. Herr Richard heard us. Much better. I'm yes. sorry. This yes, was the much wrong better. Thank you. Problem. Okay, thank you for mentioning it. Okay, so we are in a nice position. Uh, okay, you can inflate, Manu. Visual. Don't look at your manometer. Visual until it's against the wall. Yeah, go. Position is fine. Keep it on, not on traction, on push a little bit. Yes. Go, Manu. Manu, bist, bist du gegen die Wand bist. Okay, now we tilt a little bit. Now you go to 10, 12 atmosphere. Okay. So, so let us know, Eric, how do you I'm determine going... the position of this? Ah, well. How know. much is in, how much is out? Is... Uh, uh, you in the old days, deflate. In the old days, uh, I, I like to keep two articulations uh, um, inside. Now it's a little bit of an idea to have three, four millimeters. Um, some vessels you really want to be a bit more inside, others you don't. Einzelschuss bitte. I think this is fine, would you agree? Yeah, that looks good. Tim? I usually err on the side of leaving more in the aorta if there's a, if there's a gap. Of course. I totally change. agree with you. Okay. I've but changed this a little like... bit with the Bentley stents, uh, especially if you go to B pluses, that the, the, they don't foreshorten as much when you flare them. So you can actually leave less inside uh, as opposed to some other devices, uh, which, which tend to foreshorten a lot yeah. when you use the 10, 10 balloons. So I think it's convenient in that way as yeah. well. Maybe an interesting to discuss is that in such cases no, where we no, use no, relatively no, small no, ones, no, that we like to have the six millimeter no, fenestrations no, instead no, of the six no, by eights, no, when you are 100% against the wall uh, and you have large vessels, I like the six by eights because it gives you some liberal positioning. 
Yeah, I, I use almost exclusively six Go by eight um, for yeah. the same reason. And also because it, it was beat into me in Cleveland. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, it's it's a thing indeed that, that Roy and I discussed that we took over from each other a few things in Flint. Um, yeah. <clears throat> push, push, push. Yeah, it's okay. That's a bit more, bit more, Doctor bit more, Jones. bit more. Okay, deflate slowly, slowly. Project description. Advance your sheet slowly, slowly. This is where we, really I, where the okay. expertise of your team is visible. When that that coordinated effort yeah. of getting the sheath back into the stent after uh, flaring, uh, we uh, call it swallowing yeah, the balloon. But it, it really yes, requires three it's hands. It's a little bit. The, it's a little bit uh, uh, difficult <clears throat> maneuver. And so, one thing so here that's important: if your balloon is stuck you may have a little fault in your balloon and then you have to push the balloon out completely and then go back. That's a little thing to remember because with the degloving- it's true, it's better than the, yanking on it. The glove, exactly, don't yank on it. Thank you for helping me with my English. No yanking. <laughs> no yanking. <laughs> okay. The English would tell you I don't really speak English. <laughs> I'm sure you don't. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's do a little angio and then move to the next vessel. So we're going to repeat that and you can have a discussion if you want. It's it's becoming yeah. pretty boring unless we make a mistake and then everybody's awake again. Yeah. So I, I, I just rebuttal on that uh, on that fenestration side. So I've completely <laughs> left on 6 by 8 and just gotten to 6 millimeter stents. But I think it's just because... I, I used to use it for some leeway for the two two millimeters. I'm just not sure that with fusion and with better planning and with everything else, I just, I just never seen a problem. The only time I would use it is when the renal arteries are actually significantly bigger than six. So I don't want to create a stenosis before going out into the vessel, but otherwise I just use the six no. by sixes. Okay, Perry, you have the other sheet. With ein 528 so that's a really nice angiogram. And uh, I noticed that he's tried to include the entire nephrogram to ensure that his wire didn't uh, cause any perforations yeah, yeah. or anything. I think yeah. that's a good practice. I just wanted to apologize not to open it a bit more to see the bottom end. But, uh, but you're right. It's very good to see the whole kidney, but also the whole fenestration. That's why I use a multiple hole catheter and not an end hole catheter because I don't like them for this purpose screen. That's interesting. Uh, I usually yeah. do my angiograms just right through the sheath. Yeah, well, well, but then you don't see the fenestration and the connection. And this you see much better when you also have a few holes inside. So this is the reason we do it quite honestly screen. I know it's an extra step but it's something I, I really like to do. Okay, mm. so, so we're gonna still do a little angel, even if it's almost redundant screen. So come back with your sheet a little bit, Pablo, not too far. Okay, let's not and do an angel, but just before a little you bit. put the stent in. No, just a fluoro injection, just a little bit, especially mm. in the SMA. I always want to see that I'm in the main vessel. And here you can see Speichern, here you can see that we have a, a split again, but it's it's deep, and we certainly want a 528 uh, because we want to go a little bit deeper. Actually, you would be very tempted not to stand this one and to leave both renals open, maybe, but uh, you can see from the calcification that this is not done because you will have an endoleak earlier or later. Yeah, I wouldn't be tempted to do that. I would have been tempted to exactly. put a coil in the uh, in the proximal part of the other uh, renal, though. I have to tell you. Yeah, yeah. Well, you, if you look you in, uh, in detail at the CT, it's it's coming off behind a little fault and an angulation in the aorta, and it will be crushed by everything. So I'm not I'm not afraid, but I may be wrong. Okay, so, Eric, can I ask you? It, it has been done and. Uh, you mentioned uh, during the planning phase of this that there were some problems getting two fenestrations for the for the left renal. Uh, did you ever well, consider we, we did it a, quite a large, often? Yeah. Well, large fenestration with 
two stands inside the same fenestration. I think with an eight by six, or maybe even a six by eight, it would have been possible. Oh, be careful. Yeah. Always straight. Uh, it would have been possible. Immer auf gestreckt halten. Okay, pull back your sheet. I have the wire on push and the stand on traction. Okay. You have to be careful with oh, that strategy because you definitely can't guarantee seal then, right? Screen. I agree. I agree. It's it's not something that, that you know, if you have a couple of millimeters below and you are completely against the wall, it's fine. But I'm thinking in like this case, I mean, the main reason, more. as I saw it in this case for, for doing that four vessel design was actually that posterior bulge in the in the SMA. So there would have been a little bit of a of a, a juxta renal seal if I if I saw the case correctly. So perhaps in this case it would have been been doable. Mm -hmm. That bulge is uh, is evil. We need to do. We need to spend some time talking about that because people are often oh, consider that bitte. stealing zone, Stop. and uh, it is one hundred percent not. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. I, I think okay. it's, uh, Pablo, would you like to go in again? Deeply, slowly, now, slowly. Yeah. Two, three stents yes. in a device as opposed to a two vessel. Side. If you have to come back and repair that, it becomes very, very difficult. Much more difficult. You know, if you don't have time to get it right the first time, you probably will not have time to come back and, and get it right later either. So okay. you might as well go the extra Good. yard, I think, in the first, in that first case. Right then, it's, it's, uh, yeah. Uh, if I'm correct, Pablo, cannot, even if it's normal caliber, you can't rely on that aorta to seal it. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Clearly, it's not healthy. I mean, it will. Yeah. It so will we didn't include this it. vessel into the study because it's very small, just okay. to let you know. So it is a strange thing, but it's possible to exclude single vessels uh, because of uh, contraindications. So this patient will be uh, a tree B graft. Uh, I have the wire, I understand. Uh, the balloon, sorry. So this is a new balloon. You're really leading recruitment in this study, aren't you? And aren't you, Eric? Yeah, well, this is, I think, patient number 21 or so, or 22, mm -hmm. uh, 24. Sorry, Pablo is correcting me. We have another one this afternoon. Uh, yeah, I understand one. that total. I know total tomorrow is a post and the, trial, and the total recruitment is is moving forward nicely. Don't push, don't push, don't push. Yeah, yeah, don't push. We're going to do it without, Pablo. I, I don't want to go over this double angle, uh, even if we can't do the angel, but I don't want to risk anything. But uh, the recruitment is going very well because we started <coughs> relatively late, um, uh, I think about six months ago now, and we are about at 60 of the 100 patients. That's, that's awesome. Yeah, the I, interesting I part... The interesting part is that we had to exclude quite some patients because of angulations, because of previous stents, because of small vessels. So we had quite a few patients that we did that were not included. Mm. Yeah, and, well, and, knowing you, you're I, probably keeping the data on the unincluded people as well, or the excluded people. Of course, of is course, that right? of course. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. I, I, I would, I would love Bentley. to see the data on that cohort. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and we can do that very easily. So that's not a problem. I think clearly this uh, this is a very significant trial for for uh, so here you see stop, grafting, yeah? here you see here you see that our straight catheter went over the wire without uh, the uh, over the glove technique so to speak so in difficult in easy angles actually I don't advance my sheet anymore because I trust a new balloon to go in as easily as uh, through the sheet screen. Am I still one to, oh yes, I'm in 22 screen. That's your experience okay, speaking, Eric. Exactly fine. Any optimal fit there? So we're gonna do that little Tara Angio now. Screen, yeah. An Angio, yeah. So this is an ugly one, of course, because it's only part of the kidney but we will do with it. We, we knew that, we accepted it. And uh, if it stays open, it's fine. Uh, it's a fiver, it's a little bit oversized, would I say, pneu, but it looks okay. You, would you agree? Yeah, well, you've got the, the artery that appears to have the bulk of the kidney. 
Yeah, he, he has two cysts in the bottom, must I say. That's why a, a, a fairly larger part is not showing. Eine sieben French Einel, bitte. Die kann auf den Trumpf von oben This is, this is the thing that will make the patient have um, pretty significant left-sided ah. back pain after surgery, though. So it's um, usually that's my indicator that there might be some bleeding happening. So you always have to remember that an infarct can cause that pain, too. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely right. Okay, so we're going to move, proceed to the celiac and then the SMA. And I know probably most people would do the SMA first, but as I had the SMA well perfused for a long time, I think I'm, I'm, I'm fine. I, it's still perfused uh, because I don't have a sheet in there, so I don't care. And I like to go from top to bottom when I have asymmetric renals. And obviously also it's the wrong one. Okay, do we only have one seven? Then we have to go back and take the other wire. So the guys had 50% chance to find the correct one. Just a moment, put it there. And they chose the wrong one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is the ceiling. Um, so he, tell he us the get... type and uh, type of stent and the size of our uh, sheath that you're putting in. Is it an Ansel? This is now a seven French Ansel or ANL sheet. We call them ANLs, but it's an Ansel sheet. And we have a seven French now, even if we could do it with the six French, but it's so much nicer when you have the bigger ones. And it doesn't matter, we have room to spare. Yeah, don't you love it that these uh, these stents all go in through such uh, small caliber sheets? It's amazing. It's uh, the, the one thing I must say quite honestly, and it's another reason I love the B graft, is that with the six French compatibility that you don't have to to, to think about, we're going to flush that vessel a little bit. And um, you can really easily go in with a six French in the renals because the six French Ansel follows angulations better than the seven French, no doubt. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that makes it easier again. Screen, let's see where we are. So we're not going to do an angel, but just a little flush. Am I in 22? Shall I go in 16 screen? Okay, let's do a little flush, yeah. And you really see, I think that fine. very single shot I have there shows how well that uh, graft is sitting parallel in that segment of the aorta. You, know, you can really yeah. see the Z stents just lining up parallel. It looks beautiful. And I mean, it just, it just shows um, it shows the right landing. Can we have a sudden we have 927? I need to check. Yeah, I think. Yeah, D927 here, bitte. So we're going to put a B-graph 9 in the celiac and an 8 in the SMA. And you can already see from the wire that the uh, 8 by 27 will also be perfect for the SMA. So again, Eric, just repeat why you chose the celiac before the SMA in, in, in this situation. Because I go from top to bottom with the flaring, etc. I don't want to have the risk of a balloon impeding on something. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a normal thing. I always showed this one case. The first case, my guys did alone in groaning and then everything went well and everybody was happy. And then suddenly they phoned me because they had a, a one renal artery where the stent was over the first uh, uh, branch. And the other renal artery was closed and actually they had crushed with the balloon, the stent um, uh, from the other side and uh, the balloon came down. And because they had done the, the lower one first, they had the problem that that stent was crushed when they flared the other side. And we had to do a <laughs> retroperitoneal approach and a retrograde puncture of the renal artery to salvage that. That's one of the salvage cases I always show. And although it works very nicely, we clearly said, don't forget, we go from top to bottom whenever we can. It's interesting how those, uh, you know, single or dual case experience really can change the way you do things because you realize that the implications of just yeah. a, minor, a minor misstep in these procedures can really cause you a headache, yeah? Yeah. But uh, but but so, the fact that you can you can you can crush things, you know, you have to be aware of it. 
And it's the same with the bifurcate that we want with a short bullet, etc. not to have to pass with the dilator, okay, inflate, uh, uh, over and through the, uh, uh, the stents anymore. Don't push it. Schnell gegen die Wand, Manu. Und dann gucken. Tilt. Now, are you hand inflating lighter. these or uh, are you using an insufflator? No, we have an insufflator. Okay, deflate. We're not going to go in, Pablo. No, we have a, a machine, but Manuela is a very cautious. And I like to go relatively quickly against the wall. And then you can look at the manometer and inflate to the nominal 10 or 12 atmosphere. Um, uh, okay, so here you see we didn't go back in with the sheet. So I hope we will not be proven wrong because I think we're going to have a used balloon. Balloon, den wir schon benutzt haben. Okay, let's see. And you're flaring let's with see a 12? If it goes in. Uh, no, this is actually a 10 and it's, an, it's a 9 and an 8. So I don't see the reason to open an extra 12, but why not? You could do it to, to open it a bit better. But again, this is a fairly easy standard ceiling, as you can see. Can you do a little, oh, we can do the afterwards. We can do a little single shot. So let's see if the balloon passes that little hiccup there. Obviously, it's a different wire, so it shouldn't be a problem. Yeah. Okay, inflation. Push, push, push gently. Push, 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 push. Inflate, inflate, inflate. Inflate, inflate. As long as you don't disturb the distal end of the stand, I'm fine. Stop, deflate. Okay, we're going to have the engine catheter. Okay. Okay, if I... Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Pablo. Uh, we have schon the 8000 drin, ne? das hatte ich gehört. Okay, and there is 83, also we brauchen nicht mehr. Okay. Eric, what, what's your heparin level during these cases? How much do you give and what do you aim for ACTs? Or yeah, you well, we, we, we give 5000 heparin to start and then up no bitte. And then we give 3000 uh, heparin right away when the sheet sign and uh, when it's short procedures which means relatively standard triple and quadruple fenestrated we don't do acts we check it at the end uh if it's longer if they have spinal catheters we do uh, 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 uh an act and we act according to the act <laughs> Yeah, you do the same, Tim, or do you use a weight-based approach? So I always, uh, I, I, in my, my standard is that I puncture, and after I puncture the first first coin, when I have my first axis, I give two or 3,000 units, and then as soon as all my axis sites are in, I give 100 units per kilo, and for these cases, I aim to be around 250 ACT. I, I usually check it hourly, but as Eric says, if it's a fast case, that means I check it once. Uh, we aim between 200 and 250. We are not as aggressive as, as other senders that like to go to up to 300. We don't do that. Screen? Let's see where we are here. Yeah, we aim for about 280, so slightly higher than you guys. Okay. But um, yeah. And do you give protamine routinely at the end? I do. I give protamine for every case. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there is literature on that. Uh, Pablo next to me checked that because we gave a lot of heparin for our carotids and in groaning and we always said, well, don't give a bit of contrast. Uh, we always uh, gave just 5,000 and I checked with some universities, they always give 5,000. But there is literature saying that if you give only 5,000, the heparinization level is not good after 10 minutes, but it's a very short procedure. So it's better to give more heparin and then protamine. Okay, that's fine, 827. So here it's maybe the same uh, in every case that we should be a bit uh, more aggressive with the heparin to get to the level we want. And then anti-dote is at the end. 
I, I, I think I remember. Is, yes. I think I remember from from even from medical school, Eric, that the first three to four thousand units of heparin are just for the haptas, just is to block out the antibodies uh, that yeah. are in, in the body, yeah. so it actually has zero effect almost. Yeah. So the one thing I must say can... is that we usually flush our sheets with hep saline, so we oh. have five hundred and five hundred and thousand and thousand. So we add a bit of heparin because yeah. our yeah. Uh, we have pressure bags on our on every sheet that is inside usually. There you go, and that might also be a reason why you get away with the lower uh, overall ACT level, I think, because we don't do that. We just give more heparin. <laughs> give more heparin. Famous word. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Okay. Og så skal du lave, det synes jeg tip skal på, officielt som på supervisor. Der er der også et link der, hvor man skriver ham på som på supervisor. Så du spørger mig So for strategy reasons, uh, we had the upper approach prepared, but we haven't used it. This happens, but I prefer to be well set up in some cases. And here it went well, so... Yes, a mini slip off of the balloon here. We need to be careful, Pablo. Mm -hmm. So go in a little bit because you're too low. Stop. So stay there. Now advance your sheet against the balloon a little bit. Stop. Stay there. Well, I, I notice. Um, I notice. I'm not seeing the arm in your oblique projections. Uh, do you do you put the patient prep the patient with the arms out? Uh, we have one arm. Okay, we're not going to go in, Pablo, 10, 12. So we have uh, three preset positions. You go down. We have three preset positions, and it's either both arms in 90 degrees. And if we have upper excesses, we have one arm in 90 degrees and the other arm over the head. So we have a special system. Uh, I think you can see me, can you? So we, we are like this. Can you see me? Yes. 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 So, so it is like this and sometimes like this. But that's what we do. Okay, the 10 by 2, please. It, it's an important point, though, and it's actually something I learned when I observed uh, Tim in Malmo, that, uh, that you can really reduce your radiation dose by uh, moving the arms out of the field. And it makes it so much easier to see. I don't the, want uh, an arm. And, and I know many people put the arms alongside the body. And as long as you are in 90 degrees, it's fine if you put the arms as low as possible. But if you have to go a little bit oblique uh, in, in 120 yeah. or in 75, you inevitably come to the arm. And 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 that's really ugly. So we, yeah. we yeah, I don't like it. Like it does. Yeah. The way we do it is we actually. But we are we are very low. We have special low programs. Yeah. Actually, we are on one. We are on forty nanogray at this moment. But it's more for you than for us. Stop, stop, stop. That's enough. Okay, deflate. Fourteen or forty. 40. So our normal wow. program is 23. 23 nanogray. Oh, I get ours down to 18. Yeah, you can. We have that program, but uh, the first thing we see, we say is go up. That's, that's probably the Franconians that are, that are a little bit... Angio catheter? It depends on how young your eyes are, perhaps. Oh, thank you for that one. Screen, Angio, a single shot. You you can come to my place, Eric. My old CR won't give me down to anything in that in the vicinity of that. I, I use double screens instead. <laughs> well, we are in the process of of changing these two rooms here. Yeah. So these are the oldest and most used Zigos according to Siemens. The draht can raus, eine Apnoe, bitte. So they're from, they're from last year? <laughs> no, they are 10 to 12 years old. Angio? <laughs> There's little hamsters in them. <laughs> yes. Okay, that's fine. Pneu. Good. Die Bifurkationsprothese, bitte. So we will now keep that sheet in your hand. 
That's Small really nice. I love it how you've opened up the there. screen to see all of the SMA to look at the whole arcade to make sure there's no distal dissection from that um, short tip amplex. I'm bleeding. I'm and bleeding. bleeding. And yeah. so I, I think this is something you need to do because it is important. So now I we have do, our own... I always do that at an AP projection, though, because it's much easier to see all the branches in AP, I find, especially if you, if you okay. don't do a lot of these. Yeah. That's, that's I just, interesting. I flip it back to AP uh, and, and do a, a sort of a standard SMA run uh, to see all the periphery. Having, okay. having been burnt, burnt once with one of those lateral views, and I didn't and think that I put, the put a wire through a distal small branch of the SMA. Mm. And had to come back only at takes one. in the morning to embolize it. <laughs> yeah, it only takes one. So we are preparing the bifurcated graft. We will. We will uh, orient it as uh, usual. I didn't show that with the main graft, but obviously. Uh, a fenestrated graft uh, needs to be deployed, and then you see where your fenestrations are in terms of orientation and level. You adjust not too fast because you will remove uh, reposition your graft anyway. So here, the bifurcated, we have the little catheter inside through the same sheet screen. So we will just make sure that uh, the <coughs> the V now, which is the contralateral limb, goes lateral and then we always bring it back a little bit to the front as you can see so 12 o'clock is about our position okay now pablo you need to and is this oh, a Eric. custom okay. bifurcated or or do you use a unibody uh it's not a unibody it's the standard uh it's uh in this case it's uh uh a uh, 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 20 45 76 so it's the standard order form uh, bifurcated graft. So it's the short one with a 20 limp and 45 uh, 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 ipsilateral limp. Okay. Yeah, so, so it's a custom one. So do you, Eric, can I ask you how, yeah. how when you plan overlap Three. with a bifurcated to the main body, how much overlap do you, do you want? Ah, and how much do you? you made, we for? made a mistake because of you guys. It's not a problem. We're gonna do an angio first. We always plan for three stents overlap, and two stents in the iliac. So let's do an angio. We don't need a an apnea for this. Uh, usually we do the angio before we put in the graft. So let's do the angio. Yeah, up. Okay, so here we have a bit of difficulties to see where we have to go. So we will match that to the CT, um, but it's fine. Uh, so we have more than enough room. Let's have a look at the CT in coronal. I think we are fine that the iliac is much, much further. The coronal and ganz kurz, Beate. <laughs> so we are just checking the iliacs on the CT scan coronal view before deploying this graft. Oh yeah, we have we have tons of length, so we we can't even see the the iliac. And actually, actually we're gonna deploy it exactly like this. Uh, can we see the angel again, please? Because the one thing I didn't look at is the bifurcation. So we now have three stents overlap the angle. I need to see the bifurcation. So we are fine. We are in the narrow part, but we don't want to go higher. Uh, you see those big lumbars, even if we call embolize the few and the IMA. Um, so here we may struggle a bit. So I don't want to go higher to open my limb behind that ridge. You agree? I want to go just one mu higher as they say screen. And I'm going to deploy it like this. And then we're gonna deploy up to the, the limp actually. And in this case, we're going to probably catheterize. Oh, yeah, it's fine. But we're gonna catheterize quickly before uh, we open the ipsilimp completely. Usually when it's nicely open, I open the ipsilimp, but. 
think it's it's a small yeah, you coil in space in where, it's, where it's narrow, where it's narrow in the bifurcation. It's good not to open that uh, ipsilateral limb to create give you some more space, just in case uh, exactly. you know you open that ipsilateral and then all of a sudden you push the the gate closed. And ah, that's it's just moving a little bit. So I may need to use the Berenstein EFA if it doesn't make the turn. You're not a steerable guy. And did you coil those, those, uh, those lumbars for this case? Uh, I mean, I'm okay. So uh, yes, yes. We, well, we had a, a few lumbars and a big IMA. And I think that right side, it's, uh, can we show the angel again, please, Beata? You see that Anjo, the right side, they didn't make it, uh, but uh, it's full of now. Okay, screen. So what we do is let's just check quickly that we are inside. Screen. Is everybody happy at the table that we are inside? Pablo? Yep. Pere? Yep. Manu? Yep. Okay, let's so I, I like to just turn it and, you know, this is inside. You greet him. Yeah, the, the images are actually a little bit choppy when I see them, but you're flipping the arm around and it looks like it's inside. I always, having having heard of people placing limbs outside of limbs, I always use a balloon, but but that's just uh, yeah. overly cautious. Oh, we can still do it. <laughs> yeah, I have my own maneuvers as well. Screen? Um, I, I haven't heard of people. I actually did it myself, so... <laughs> I did. Yeah. So. I always as, say... as we say, burned once, burned once. <laughs> yeah. I always say all these mistakes have been made. You don't need to repeat them. Exactly. Mm. Exactly. Yes. Okay. You have to sheet have Pablo. Made by people Are in we this gonna room? balloon it? Okay. <laughs> Can you pull this out, Eva? I'm gonna massage. Yeah. Screen. It's important, I think, to massage the sheets or to to help to go out that you don't need too much force over the wire. You don't want a Lundequist to be kinked. Yeah. Okay. I have the wire. Call it power can, uh, but please hold the sheet, Pablo. We're going to put in the balloon and balloon first. And then we're going to put in an amplatz on the left side, Eva. Uh, and then we're going to do a little Tim in interludium, which means that we're going to have the 10 by 2 balloon screen inside for the audience, actually. Do I stand right, Eva? Yeah. Screen. I think that the I think that the message, Eric. Uh, obviously, you you do what you're comfortable with it, but I think to our audience, the message is it's better safe than Thank sorry you. when it comes to contralateral limbs. So, at this point yes. of the case, when you've done the fenestrated component, and really you should have, you should I be done with that. the difficult um, part so of the we... procedure. It's it's good to uh, it's good to you know get out safely, and you don't want to end up with placing uh, them in the yeah. I couldn't agree more. Good, you concur. <laughs> Stop screening. Eric and Tim, I'm very pleased to announce that uh, Professor Stefan Halon has now joined us and will be uh, participating in the commentary for a while before he gives his talk. Welcome, Stefan. Oh, you, 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 No. Are we switching no, to French I'm now? No, I'm in trouble. No, I'm in trouble. <laughs> Bonjour, <laughs> Stefan. Comment ça va? Wie, wie geht's? Aber. Sehr gut, danke. Es geht sehr gut in diesem deutschen OP, Stefan, mais nous pouvons continuer à parler en français si tu veux. Good. Uh, 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 let's you guys are doing that, I'm doing Danish. Green? Yeah, I'm, I yes. speak English. <laughs> well, you know, it's a Tara is Canadian, so she's half French. Um, yeah. Green? And Tim almost moved to Paris recently. Stop so. screening. The, bu the <laughs> balloon, all the sheet. The 10 by 2 balloon. So, Stefan, welcome. We are finishing the case. Uh, actually, just to put you on the topic, uh, we planned on having maybe one or two renal arteries from the top because they were a bit ugly, but uh, everything went well from below. So, we didn't miss the upper approach. And, uh, well, better safe than sorry, I just heard. Trat of Zukalten. Okay. Is, so is, are you finishing the, um, the the second case? Yeah. No, the second is about to be ordered actually, and it's a nicer and easier case. So 
we're going to do that. Tim, for you, you agree? You're fine? Yes. going to turn a little bit left screen. A little bit left, a little okay. bit right. Is it a compliant or a non-compliant balloon? This is a non-compliant balloon. This is a... Yeah. Ah, uh, you 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 would have wanted uh, the I use a mushroom. The, mushroom, the champignon, the mushroom. mushroom. Yeah, yes. the champignon. But I'm not. I, I think it's a very good, very good idea. But uh, let's go quickly on AutoMap and have the uh, measuring catheter again. So we have a double measuring. I use a reverse curve catheter and hook it on the bifurcation. We call yeah. it the cowboy yeah. maneuver. Yeah. <laughs> Many, many ways uh, to do many ways. it. Uh, and I think the most important thing is that you have to ask in your room that everybody is perfectly happy with it. And if anybody has doubt, you have to check it. Well, it means that you have people that understand what you're doing in the room. Mm -hmm. uh, that is absolutely correct, Stefan. That is, that is absolutely true. Correct. Now, Eric, when you do that, I'd be interested in, as a student of human behavior. I'd be interested to know how many people tell you in the operating room they disagree really? with you. Uh, well, if somebody has a question, my guys will tell me. Uh, so oh, one, two, three, four, five. Okay. So here the problem, if you see the angel, I don't know what you see. If we we go very high. We could stick to a, a 13. If we go lower, we certainly need a 16. And we measured uh, a 20, uh, 77 or 59. So we want to go a little bit lower. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah. Let's have the 2059, please. Okay. Over when, I, um, house, connected. when I connected, you were discussing about a narrow um, distal aorta and, uh, and diseased iliac. Uh, something mm -hmm. we do uh, on occasion is that uh, we don't um, get uh, the uh, graft with, uh, with uh, the, the usual limbs, but we put big graft plus inside the, um, in, inside the narrow aortic lumen and, and we uh, do a kissing angioplasty and, and then we dilate them. Okay. We use 1057 and then we get them up to 12 with a, a larger balloon. Is that something you would consider sometimes? Uh, I haven't done that. We've done kissing stents and we just published it in the Annals of Vascular Surgery that couplings do very well if they are reliant uh, in terms of uh, uh, difficult vessels, angulation or narrow distal aorta. Uh, so, uh, but we then use just simple uh, 10 by 4 uh, balloon expandable kissing stents inside the limbs. So we haven't used b yeah. plus for that purpose. It might be a smart idea to avoid a tear or another problem, Stefan. Yeah. But we haven't yeah, seen the problems is, up is, to is, now. Is, the, the option is nice to consider when you have a very diseased IDAC on one side, so then you only yeah. need an 8 French sheath to, to get the limb. Aha. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yeah, I understand. Okay, so we're gonna go in here, screen. Okay, that's about right. I think we should be fine. I'll deploy it like this and don't overdo it, of course, but I mean, there is no way there is going to be this connection here. And then we're going to check what happens with the ballooning. And if we need kissing stents here that we put down, OK, we can go out with this completely. OK. The encoder balloon then, bitte. Behind loop, yeah. So we're going to balloon this, then do a single shot. I like to see with the ballooning whether the other limp is being pushed back. If needed, we're going to use two kissing stents. 1038, when notwendig. Yeah, thank you. And I think attention to I'm detail sorry. at this point in the case is really important, especially if the proximal part was difficult. You tend to kind of 
uh, relax a bit here, but it's really important because the bulk of the the kind of important endoleaks, the one B endoleaks, uh, happen because of distal problems. So uh, this is a crucial point in the case. I agree that at the end, it's the moment not to rush and not to go too quickly. So I'm gonna magnify this a little bit for the audience screen, and I, I'm gonna inflate it again, and then I look at the other limb. It's not that bad, actually. It's a little bit to the front, which should be a good thing. So <laughs> what I don't like is this movement probably showing me that there are still a few big lumbars active there. I'm not going to go deeper. That is fine. And then, okay. Okay, good. So I'm probably going to go a little bit in RAO screen to open this single shot. I think it's just enough, uh, Stefan, Tim, Tara. Yeah, I wouldn't go further. Yeah. And I think a good way to see compression of the limbs is exactly what you're showing here, Eric, is to just do two lateral sort of the 45 oblique projections of the limbs. That's sort of a cheat comb beam CT, a rapid comb beam, if you wish, to make sure yeah. that you don't feel yeah. yourself by just taking Screen. one projection. Uh, so I think that's a good teaching point for, for the audience as well. I think it's a, it's a, um, it's a narrow call screen. Obviously, if I turn it like this, I go to one limb. But I think the projection we had with about 20 degrees RAO opens the limbs the best. Screen. Maybe that's even, no, it's not too much. Okay, single shot again, please. Just one single shot. So I think it's narrow there, but it's, it's wide enough. Would you agree? Considering that the distal end is 20, I think a 10 will not do a lot. I'm very tempted not to put in kissing stents here. Yeah, I wouldn't. I think okay. it's fine. I, I... I mean, it's a two minute job, but I don't think it's necessary in this case. Screen? Agreed. I must say, so I we're going to put the catheter in position. I mostly finish the procedures with a cone beam CT. Uh, that's what we do. And then, yeah, then you we still do don't. We still don't. Yeah, yeah. So I, 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 I need I need to get my second that. patient on the table and yeah. we will have trouble enough because the next one will probably have to have a night ICU. We had to we wanted to do him yesterday, but for cardiac and pulmonary reasons in an eight centimeter aneurysm, the anesthesiologist wanted to check of cardiology and, and pneumology and I can agree with them. But now I, I have to get him on the table today because I have another post dissection aneurysm tomorrow. So, so the yeah, on on from twenty, please. Screen. So I'm a little bit in 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 stress with terms of of availability because everybody has announced that from next week on we are going to be extremely restricted. I don't know about you guys, but we have about two hundred corona patients on the in the hospital, about 50 on the ICU, and it's growing every day. The numbers are growing every day, so I'm not too happy again. The numbers are not good in France. Uh, so far, it's not uh, no big impact uh, on our uh, list, but uh, I'm not sure what's going to happen in the coming weeks. OK, hold the sheet, please, Per. Yeah, it's... Uh, well, I, I'm, I'm hoping for you, Stefan, and for all of us to come to Paris, because uh, you can see a nice case today, but critical issues is really about these discussions uh, during one and a half days, and the people really benefit from that, I think. Screen? It's true. It's 48 hours of discussions like this. Exactly. So I'm going to go just a little bit higher. Okay, we are fertig. Then, macht uns noch mal eine Apnoe, bitte. Apnoe. 
Okay, Angio. So Stefan, don't be worried. The left renal, we killed one. Okay, well, I think that's fairly acceptable. We see the, <laughs> the type twos in the bottom, of course. So I think it's okay. I mean, we have a serious pneu. So approximately we are fine. I you agree, celiac trunk, SMA branches, two renal arteries. Distally, we are fine. And then we see these lumbars come in and kill our whole procedure, so to speak. I hope this will not be a problem. Uh, we killed a few, as you can see, but uh, then uh, the little brothers and nep nephews and others come up screen. But otherwise, I think nice, we though. can be happy with this procedure. Yes, we are fully heparinized now. So we will give some protamine and get out. Bitte 5,000 yeah. Einheiten protamine. Brilliant case. So Brilliant. It's, congratulations, it's, it's Eric. Important point from Tara is, is that uh, most of those early type 2 and leaks will actually uh, occlude. And uh, I think the result is, is, is really nice. I, I missed the beginning of the case. Did you use preloaded system or did you do uh, everything uh, no, we, the same? We had a we had a preloaded catheter in one renal artery, uh, being uh, uh, being aware that we might have to to um, uh, kleine Schleuse und uh, Draht und Katheter, uh, being yeah. aware that we might have to come from above uh, for one of the renal arteries for whatever reason. So we had an indwelling catheter in the left one. And I catheterized both from below. I actually catheterized the two left renal arteries. I demonstrated that and then decided on which one was the best because that was not so easy. And we kept the wire in that one, killed the smaller one, and did everything from below. Fabulous. And what sheath did you use uh, on the control side to get uh, all your uh, renal and uh, visceral sheaths up? The 18 French sheet, the 18 French terumo, because we never use more then two Ansel sheets at a time. Okay, great. And so Eric, and uh, did, 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 you use, uh, did you use a steerable sheet for catheterization in the beginning or you just go no, by all? No, 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 no. We no, don't no, use no, steerable no. sheets in fenestrate, must I say. And why is that? Uh, it's very rare, you know, once once in a hundred amplats, but we, we, we usually either do it with standard materials and if it's really difficult, we like to have an indwelling catheter and we don't mind once in a while to come from above because it's not only about the catheterization, but also about the relaxed positioning of the stent. I like in a very steep renal artery to position the stent from above and it lies beautiful. You don't have to tilt it. Uh, sometimes it's much nicer. Okay, guys, Great. with that- uh, Great, Eric. Well, I, I think like we're gonna to... move to Stefan. If um, Eric, please do. Great case. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you very much, and, and 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 enjoy the rest. I will be around. We're gonna quickly close this percutaneous things, and then we're done. Yes, please join Bravo. us again for the discussion later. I will um, try now, to do my best. Thank you. Wonderful. All right. All right. Thank great. Thanks. Uh, now bye I'm bye. um I'm very pleased to present uh, Stefan Halon, who is going to tell us about his three-year clinical results of bridging stents and uh, and hopefully give us lots to talk about. Uh, Stefan, over to you. Thank you very much, Tara. Um, can you see my slides? Yeah, there we are. Uh, I, I was uh, asking those questions to Eric um, because uh, I, I want to make sure that I, I'm not... Um, uh, well, I, I would like to show other ways of performing those fenestrated endograft and the benefit of using the the, the Bentley uh, B graft in in, in those uh, in those cases. Uh, now um, I have uh, the following uh, disclosures, and uh, what I wanted to uh, to highlight is that um, most of those complex uh, AAA that we're treating with uh, fenestrated or branched endograft actually will need three or four uh, target vessel to be included in the uh, endograft design to have a, a good long-term uh, result. Uh, at the beginning of the experience, we were treating those patients with only two renal uh, fenestrations and a scallop for the SMA. Well, uh, most of those patients have, as you can see on this slide, a posterior bulge, 
of uh, the uh, the proximal uh, visceral uh, aorta and uh, so if you don't get the sinnings on above the celiac chunk then there's a risk of failure uh, in the long term Now that's why um, to avoid uh, coming from the control groin uh, with a large sheath, because you need to access uh, four uh, target vessel, uh, we've uh, started uh, using uh, routinely uh, the uh, preloaded uh, catheter uh, delivery system, uh, which uh, actually gives you direct access uh, from the delivery system of the endograph to uh, the renal or uh, a visceral fenestration. You, you can choose up to up to two. And you can see that this system uh, can uh, only uh, be compatible with six French sheaths. Uh, so that's why most of the time we use it uh, for um, uh, renal arteries. And uh, six French 90 sheaths, so, so you need to use a long shaft uh, bridging stent when um, utilizing those uh, um, pre-loaded catheters. And this is an old slide, but showing you that uh, over uh, a wire that has been pushed uh, in the outer, you can advance uh, the, the, the sheath all the way to the fenestration and keeping the wire in position to have a, a stable platform with a parallel wire and catheter, uh, we uh, come from the groin into the, um, the target vessel. Now, another way of doing that, uh, quoted by Tara Tim, uh, is also to use a steerable uh, sheath, and um, which uh, is uh, one way of getting a stable platform in very uh, tortuous anatomy uh, uh, also. Now, this is uh, starting to use routinely uh, those uh, preloaded system is uh, one reason why uh, many years ago I, I switched uh, to the uh, uh, big rafts um, bridging stents uh, because they were uh, the, the only platform uh, that was available uh, at that time uh, with a larger than six meter diameter and longer than 22 meter length uh, bridging stent compatible with six French uh, uh, sheath, and which obviously was a, a big uh, game uh, changer. Now, I said that I switched to the B-graft, but only when uh, the second generation of B-graft uh, was available. Second generation is the one where the uh, stand connectors had been increased uh, uh, by uh, 20% and uh, of paramount importance. Also, the wall thickness uh, of the uh, bridging stand uh, doubled. And it went from uh, 100 micron to 200 micron. So I think that the first generation was not designed and was not appropriate uh, for a fever, but that this uh, latest uh, generation, uh, uh, in my mind, was the, uh, the perfect uh, match uh, uh, for a bridging stent uh, for fever uh, cases. Now you can see on this slide uh, how accurate uh, the uh, uh, delivery of the uh, big graft is, and you can see also uh, the shape of the stent uh, after flaring the uh, aortic portion. Uh, usually I use six millimeter uh, fenestrations uh, for a renal artery that I flare with a nine millimeter balloon and I use a 10 millimeter fenestration for uh, eight millimeter fenestration, sorry, for uh, the uh, visceral arteries. And then I would use a, a 10 millimeter uh, flaring balloon. Um, we, this was quoted uh, uh, by team uh, at the end of uh, each uh, procedure. Oops, I'm sorry, it went too fast, but I, I, I perform, let me go back, I perform a condim CT uh, in order uh, to make sure uh, that uh, there's no issues with the, uh, the bridging stand that uh, we have um, a, a nice uh, flaring at the level of the fenestration and uh, that uh, the, uh, the, the, the stand is not kinked. Um, this is quite nice to, to do it this way because then uh, the patient can be discharged uh, very fast and then we would only see patient back uh, in consult a couple of weeks or months later with the, uh, the post-op CT scan and doesn't require a, a lot of contrast uh, uh, to do that. Now, the other reason for uh, using the, uh, the B-graft was that it was the only available uh, with um, uh, large diameters and a short length, and uh, which I think is, is also something that is very important for fever, uh, especially uh, uh, when uh, you're treating a, 
uh, SMA with the early division branch or a downward growing SMA that can easily have a kink between a, uh, the breeding stent and the, uh, the native vessel. Uh, this uh, short length is also very important for the celiac trunk to avoid covering uh, the, the bifurcation. So you can see here uh, an example of a, a, a celiac trunk scented with, a, I think, a, a 9 or 10 by 27 bridging stent. Uh, this is the flaring. I don't know if the uh, videos are, are running. Uh, this is the, uh, the selective uh, uh, angio uh, showing that uh, all uh, division branches of the celiac trunk are, are patent. And obviously having uh, this option of uh, uh, large bridging stent uh, short length is, uh, I think, uh, uh, was a, uh, also a, a game changer. Now, the following video is uh, something that uh, you saw um, uh, with Eric's case as they did the various steps uh, to make sure that uh, the procedure uh, uh, will fly. So obviously, uh, you need to advance your bridging stent uh, protected uh, through the fenestration into the target vessel. So we get the six frame shift inside the target vessel. And also, uh, before uh, moving the uh, flaring balloon that you can see here, uh, we push the sheath back uh, into the target vessel, into the, uh, the, the, the stent, while deflating uh, uh, the balloon. And I think if you do that, there's never uh, a conflict uh, between the, uh, the, the struts of the stent and the various uh, ancillary tools uh, that uh, you're utilizing. You can see here the, the, the flaring. Uh, you have to uh, make sure that uh, you, you push on the uh, flaring, the shaft of the uh, flaring balloon to make sure that you properly flare the, the top and the, the bottom of uh, your uh, stent uh, protruding uh, in the, the aortic lumen. And you can see here the, the selective NGO uh, showing a, a, a nice uh, result here. I'm not going to show you the, the whole case because uh, Eric beautifully uh, demonstrated that uh, those procedures can be uh, straightforward. Uh, what I'm going to focus on now is uh, our evaluation of the B-graph, because uh, I told you a couple of years ago, I switched to B-graph, but uh, I, I like to have data to support uh, what I'm doing. And so what we did is after implanting the first uh, 100 B-graph, we uh, did uh, first an early evaluation at one year that was uh, published uh, in the uh, European Journal of uh, Vascular and Vascular Surgery in, uh, in 2018. And then I'll show you the, the update. Now you can see that uh, we looked at uh, 39 patients treated uh, with fenestrated endograph, uh, which comprised 150 fenestrations. And in those fenestrations, uh, more than uh, well, 101 B graft were used, approximately half in renal arteries and half in, in, in visceral uh, arteries. The uh, outcomes were excellent. One patient had major issue and uh, because I actually uh, dissected uh, one uh, renal artery on one side and had a kidney uh, hematoma on the other side so that uh, one patient had a bilateral occlusion of uh, his uh, renal uh, arteries, uh, which was in, due to technical issues uh, uh, during the case and a very diseased uh, bilateral renal arteries and, uh, and atrophic uh, kidneys. But apart from that uh, unique patient with very early uh, technical issues, uh, there was no early or late issues, no occlusion, no stenosis at one year uh, in uh, the remaining 38 uh, patients, and no uh, endoleak uh, issues, so flaring of those uh, bridging stents. It's not an issue. There's no uh, uh, fabric tear. Now, more uh, recently, uh, we've uh, updated uh, the follow-up of those uh, first uh, 100 uh, uh, big graft, and this is currently under review at the GEVT, and uh, we now have the almost uh, uh, three-year uh, uh, data uh, available, 33-month uh, uh, median uh, follow-up. And what you can see is that uh, in addition to that patient that had a uh, early uh, secondary procedure because of bilateral uh, renal uh, occlusion, uh, two other patients had uh, bridging stent uh, issues uh, uh, during follow-up. And I think I have detailed those in the next slide. Um, you can see one patient had a 1C uh, endoleak. Uh, I had uh, undersized the, uh, the bridging stent, and so this patient underwent uh, a uh, simple angioplasty through a five-friend sheath. 
and the other patient had a, a renal stem kink that I realigned with a with a new uh, B graft. So uh, at three years, um, in addition to the early issue, two other patients required a, a secondary procedure. But if you look at the uh, patency uh, at three years, um, again, apart from that early patient, every single bridging stent uh, remained open. So 97% uh, uh, patency rate at uh, a free uh, year. What is interesting also is uh, we uh, had a deep look into the, uh, the CT scans and on the workstation, we checked uh, how uh, the stent were fled, how much of the stent was protruding into the aortic lumen, what was the distance of uh, the fenestration to the origin of the target vessel. And if uh, you look at this next uh, busy slide, I'm not gonna go through the whole result, but it actually shows that uh, the, uh, the length of uh, stent protruding in, in, in the aorta is between three and four a millimeter and it stays, it doesn't move during follow-up and that most of our patients had defenestration abutting the origin of the target vessel, which means that if you use uh, uh, the bridging stent in this setup, you can expect uh, excellent outcomes. So I think you have to uh, design uh, your endograph with the fenestration uh, position at the origin of the target vessel, no gap, and this is the best way to achieve a good uh, long-term uh, outcomes. So in conclusion, um, I think the, having access to the big graph variable was a real game changer because of um, its uh, low profile, six French compatibility up to eight millimeter. It is something uh, very comfortable to, to work with. It's highly flexible. Uh, as you could see on the free uh, um, measurement, uh, we very precisely uh, position uh, those stents. They're very easy to track, even in, in, in tortuous anatomy. We have a specific length that uh, are uh, perfect uh, for our fever uh, cases. And I've showed you that we have a uh, very favorable uh, long-term um, uh, results. But I want to make it crystal clear that we are using the big wrap for fenestrations with the fenestration uh, position next to the original target vessel for those branch cases, such as the one I'm showing you now. We are not using the BigGraph Peripheral, but we are using the BigGraph Plus, which is a, a different platform. And I'm sure that you will uh, talk about the BigGraph Plus later on. And you can see here in this patient with three fenestrations for both renals and the SMA, we use BigGraph Peripheral uh, for those fenestrations. And for the branch to the celiac trunk, we used uh, uh, the BigGraph uh, so, uh, and the Big Graph Plus is now my uh, number one bridging stent when uh, performing a, a branched uh, uh, endograft. And especially since we've switched uh, to performing those procedures exclusively from the groin using a, a large uh, cerebral sheath, you can see here in an aptus sheath, uh, the one that is uh, normally used for with endostaplers. Using that sheath, we perform all our branch cases from the groin, and the, uh, the Big Graph Plus will track really nicely into uh, the target vessel uh, uh, with uh, that uh, difference. So conclusion, and that's my final, final conclusion. I think uh, that big graph peripheral is, is uh, uh, the best option for and but the big graph plus is uh, the best option uh, uh, for PVAR. Thank you very much. Uh, very happy to answer any questions. Darren team. Wonderful. Thank you, Stefan. That was uh, really, really insightful and so wonderful that you've been able to collect all that data over the last three years. Um, tell me, you know, everyone's always asking me to stand on the podium and, and say what's the ideal stent graft for a fenestrated device. Do you think we're getting closer to that? Yeah, I think uh, we have a platform uh, that is uh, providing a uh, um, excellent uh, long-term outcomes and that is a, a very uh, swift uh, to use in, in, in everyday practice. So uh, I believe that um, uh, we have a, a great stent. Uh, obviously uh, we would like uh, the, the whole procedure to, to be even faster and then if we could get a, a balloon that would uh, uh, inflate the stent and a flare it at the same time then I think we would have uh, the perfect uh, bridging stent. So we're not far from the perfect bridging stent. Yeah. What do you think, Tim? No, I think, I mean, just seeing the evolution of stents, like clearly what we have new is now is it's a huge step forward to what we used to have, both in, in terms of what we discussed during the case with available lengths, 
uh, and and uh, the compatibility down to six French and seven French is just a huge advantage, as, as Stefan mentioned, both for, for our branch cases and fenestrated cases. And when we add on that, uh, sort of the ease of use, the, the how, how well the stent is retained on the balloon, and now we're seeing the follow-up data, and, and kudos to you, uh, uh, Stefan, for bringing that out and, and gathering this data, which is so, so important. We, we I mean, we preach this often that it's not getting out of the operating room, but it's actually keeping keeping these things alive as, as we move forward. And, and clearly the data is, is, is showing that. Uh, I'm sure there will be newer stents uh, and, and improvements, but it feels like we're starting reaching this plateau phase of, of, of the stent development instead of, and we've left the steep curve behind, which is, which is thankful. We've had, I think all three of us, we've been there for, for the for the ups and downs of bridging stents. And, and, and this is really a, a step forward I, as I see it. Yeah, and, uh, Tara, agree more. If I may add, um, all three of us have been trained by Roy Greenberg and we've learned that whatever you do, uh, you need data to support it. And I think this is what is so important is that uh, um, even if a stent looks good, if you don't have data to support what you're doing, uh, you're you know, just making hypotheses. And now we know that this stent is doing a great job and I really feel comfortable using it uh, routinely. I also think yeah. that just- Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna push you both on- your, I'm just gonna Go ahead, just yeah. again, again mention the retrospective data, but also I think the fact that we're, in, you know, that with this stent, we're now engaged in this prospective trial really shows uh, both the commitment from 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 the company making the stent, but also the belief in that this is actually a stent that will work. And we've never had that in front of street and branch devices before. So really excited about the data that that from from the prospective trial to, to, to come up as well. I'm going to push you both a little bit on stent length because we've had a couple questions from the audience about the difference between the 28 millimeter B graft, the 29 millimeter VBX, and the 32 millimeter V12. Now, I know my opinion on this, but I'd love to know why is it that the VBX and the um, B graft, even though they may be similar lengths, don't really have similar indications? Or can you comment on that in your practice? In, in my practice, um, again, I, I really make a huge difference between bridging stents for fenestrations and uh, bridging stent for branches. Uh, I think the, the VBX uh, has been developed as a bridging stent for branches and, and does a great job in this indication. And uh, uh, there are a couple of uh, uh, studies uh, uh, showing that. Um, now, I... Um, bit more concerned about using it in fenestration because the stent is not fully supported. Uh, there are gaps between uh, the struts of the stent. And um, uh, again, if we have data to show in the long term that it matches what we currently have, why not? But uh, in, in the meanwhile, I'm um, feeling more secure using the, uh, the big graft in uh, fenestrations. Um, you were talking about the length. I think that if we're talking about a complex AAA, not teracob abdominal cases, uh, what uh, we've seen, and uh, we have, uh, again, data to support that, is uh, you don't want to use long uh, bridging stent. And I think that the 22 millimeter uh, stent is, is nice because you don't want to reach that point where the renal artery uh, proximal moves with the alta and distal moves with the respiratory motion of the kidney. You want to stay in this uh, proximal uh, part. And then regarding the, um, the visceral artery, uh, the issue is more uh, with the anatomy of those uh, downward going target vessel. If you go too far in, the, uh, in, in that vessel, um, then you might uh, end up with a kink uh, between the bridging stent and the target vessel, especially the SMA. So that's why when using a 27 millimeter uh, bridging stent in, in an eight or nine millimeter SMA, you actually have probably at 22 uh, protruding in the SMA and you're often at, at before that spot where the SMA just dives uh, uh, down. So I think one reason for having those good outcomes is because we have the, uh, the appropriate length for um, our practice. Yeah, I think that you really made the critical point there that VBX really wasn't designed for fenestrations and uh, I think uh, irrespective of length. Um, 
the other question that some of the people in the chat asked is whether or not the uh, the skeleton of the Bentley uh, makes a difference in terms of your ability to recannulate or to get back into to branches. What do you guys think about that? So I, I can I can uh, maybe answer that quickly because I had that same question in my early experience and, and had the great benefit of calling my French colleague there, Dr. Halon. Uh, and, and it is a little bit different if you have uh, if you compare it to, to grafts that are that are wedged in PTF or not, where you you can sort of force yourself through the stent by gliding off that, and you have to use a little bit of a different technique when you use the bent, at least in my mind, and you have to sort of be a little bit more relaxed when you re-enter that device. But once you understand what you're trying to do and how this works, it's just never an issue uh, to re-enter the stent. Uh, because of that um, uh, stent that's bare on the inside. So it's a little bit of a tweak in the technique when you use that uh, as opposed to what, what we were used to using uh, other, other bridging stents, at least for me. Stepan, I, I anything? Agree. There's a, a small learning curve as with any a new um, ancillary tool that you, you're using. Um, that's why I was showing uh, this uh, short video on, on how you should uh, uh, use the uh, the balloon to 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 get your sheath back uh, in order to make sure that you have a uh, really uh, uh, no uh, conflict uh, you know with the sheaths balloon catheter uh, uh, whatever uh, and then if, if during follow up you need to to go back um, I I think that the most important thing is actually how did you flare uh, that bridging stent in the first place and, and then getting access uh, to the lumen is not such a such a big deal so. Um, during the procedure, it's really not an issue at all. And uh, during follow-up, um, I've had I'm been once in a situation uh, uh, what a bit critical because it was in the dissection. It was a very long uh, bridging stent. But uh, apart from that, we had a couple of those cases where we had to go back, and it was uh, really straightforward. Great. We've had another question about dislodging stents. So, you know, Eric made a point about what order he did all his fenestrations in. Certainly all of us have been in a position where we may have knocked into a stent on the way in or out with a different uh, uh, device. Talk about, to tell me a little bit about your experience with this, whether or not you think that's decreased over the years and uh, if there are any tricks you have to ensure that it doesn't happen. So I think the dislodging is, is mostly about uh, having a, a, a secure path uh, all the way to the target vessel. Uh, if you're uh, obviously uh, not pushing your sheath uh, uh, through the fenestration into the, uh, into the target vessel, then you're at risk of uh, at one point uh, with all the angulation, uh, having a, a conflict between uh, the bridging stent delivery system and the fenestration and, and then the target ve vessel because uh, often at that stage of the procedure, uh, everything is not perfectly aligned and you might have a, a small um, discrepancy between the, the fenestration and the origin of the target vessel. So, so I think it, it is very important to make sure that if you cannot get the sheath into the target vessel, you first balloon uh, the, uh, the, uh, the fenestration and the origin of the target vessel to be able to, to push the sheath inside. Now, if you stick to the IFU, uh, it's, it's, it's very rare that um, uh, we have those uh, issues of uh, stent uh, uh, getting uncreeped. I, I think I actually don't remember um, such, such a case uh, happening. Um, it really also depends on the sheaths that you're using. Um, uh, probably there are some sheaths that are uh, more six French than others, and uh, so you have to be uh, careful about the, the ancillary uh, sheaths uh, that you are using. I can add to that, maybe Tara, just, uh, I mean, that's one point with retainment on the balloon and keeping the sheath in the target. The other, of course, is when you have, as Eric mentioned, going from, from top to bottom to avoid when you flare stents, when you push the contralateral device up through. I think what's critical about this is that you pay attention to what you're doing in the field. And, and I think oftentimes, and all of us have seen that, um, that, that people start relaxing once they've catheterized vessels and they're not watching what they're doing. They go low, low on the mag, they go low on the fluoro, and, and then you start making mistakes. I think as long as you're paying attention to where you are and how your device, devices are tracking up alongside those bridging stents, 
most of the time you can get away with it. You can change position. You can put some slack on a wire or come from another approach to avoid that. And then for me, again, going back to what Stefan mentioned with cone beam CT, really at the end of the procedure, uh, doing those cone beam scans at the end has really removed uh, my nervousness and having on the one month or discharge CT seeing, you know, because still it happens that you have a butted, a stent, and you need to go back. But if you're doing the case, that's literally a five minute extra maneuver, you know, before you close the groins, you do your spin, everything looks fine. If it doesn't, you recatheterize the balloon once and you're done. So I think paying attention, I always tell my young vascular surgeons that you would never operate, do an open repair of anything with the lights off in the operating room. And, and equally here, you should pay attention to the screen. That's where things go on. Yeah, I can't agree more. It's it's really important to develop that discipline of not doing anything without watching the screen because I think uh, people tend to push stuff around and uh, when in early in their career. Um, now we've had a question about chimneys, and uh, I, I'm wondering, uh, you know, sometimes chimneys are necessary for bailouts. Have, have either of you had any experience using the B graft in chimneys? Would you recommend it? Um, do you just hate chimneys and not want to talk about it? What do you think? I must, I I must confess, time. switch to another talk. <laughs> no, I think, uh, you know, I, I can't, I don't have experience of using uh, bee grafts in chimneys uh, more than once or twice uh, for emergency cases. And they seem then to work as well as anything else, as well as it would work with the chimney, uh, you know, but I've used them. We, we've done a, a number of, uh, of insight to fenestrations for, for emerging cases now for, for, for renals and SMAs. And there we've used the Bentley and they work, work great for that. And I, I and like you guys, I'm not a, a great uh, fan of uh, chimneys, having in mind that it can be a very helpful as a bailout uh, solution. And um, uh, maybe the Big Graph Plus um, might be a good platform uh, in this uh, specific uh, uh, setup. Um, I'm, I still don't believe that there are that many indication of uh, um, chimneys as a first line uh, therapy. So, um, and you can see with the preloaded, uh, with the uh, silver sheaf, we we're trying to get uh, away as much as possible from access from, uh, from above. Uh, and this will reduce stroke and it will uh, help you to work in an x-ray safe environment. So I'm not gonna push it, but Having in mind that in some cases I was happy to uh, to uh, to do chimneys to to save a, a renal artery and and probably um, if I had the the choice I would use a, a big graph plus. Great. Um, I think Eric's case was interesting because there were those two renal arteries and uh, he chose not to coil. Um, there's been a couple questions about what to do about accessory renals. Um, I'm wondering, so it would have been my preference to coil just to be safe. Um, what, uh, what would you guys say? Would, would you routinely coil accessories or what, how do you deal with them? Well, I think that um, if uh, the uh, accessory renal is in the middle of the sac, you really need to call it because otherwise it's, it's going to be responsible for a, a huge type 2 endoleak because uh, it's a terminal uh, vascularization. So it just sucks blood. Uh, and so that the lumbers and the IMA will just keep on feeding that. Uh, uh, that um, um, now, if the accessory is at the level of the ceiling zone, you might question, is it necessary to do it? Uh, having said that, I would do it uh, uh, routinely. And I, I didn't see the uh, pre-op CT, but I think that Eric, like uh, us, would be very aggressive at trying to keep every uh, accessory uh, open if it's uh, four millimeter or, or above. And uh, probably this was not the case, or maybe it was too close to the... Uh, uh, to the main uh, uh, renal trunk. I think it was a little bit closer. I think I agree with you, Tara, actually, in this case, because it's so close to the other fenestration, he actually catheterized on both. Uh, I think he even had a wire in that renal that he chose not to, to revask. And, and in that setting, I would be hard pressed not to just drop a coil there. Uh, I would, because there'd be so many regrets that that actually creates a leak later. 
Uh, other than that, I totally agree with what Stefan said, when or when not to, to, to embolize them. And uh, if they're in the ceiling zone, I, uh, I, I, I embolize them if it takes me less than four minutes. If, if I have to struggle to get in, or I, just, I just leave it if I think the graph will seal against the wall. And, and yeah. something interesting but um, in the same line is that I, I saw, again, I missed the beginning, but uh, I think Eric uh, positioned a couple of coils in uh, some lumbar arteries. And uh, um, we are more and more aggressive at uh, closing the IMA and closing a, a large um, lumbars to avoid those uh, type 2 endoleaks that are you know, a, a bit frustrating uh, during follow-up for the patient and for the physician. Yeah, I love it that these cases have gotten so short that we now have the luxury of considering doing things like that. Whereas in the old days, we would have said, you know, going to be all day on the table, we wouldn't add an embolization procedure, or we'd bring them in in a staged fashion. Um, what's your rule of thumb, though? So I kind of feel if it's taking me a while to get into a lumbar, that lumbar is probably small enough that it's not that important. Do you, do you have some indicators of what you definitely will and won't um, coil? It mostly is a question of diameter. Um, I'm quite aggressive with the IMA. Uh, anything that is free or larger, I would go for it, especially as uh, uh, you just mentioned, uh, it, it is with a cerebral sheath and uh, with the diffusion, it's now much, much easier than it used to be to access the, 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 those vessels. Uh, for the lumbers, I, I, I tend to re to just select one or two if they're very large, but I'm not that aggressive. And as you said, uh, if I cannot get inside this, that uh, it's not worth uh, uh, closing it. So any anything you think we haven't spoken about in this session that you feel um, is important for some of our newer um, colleagues who are just starting in the field? Any words of wisdom? I, I didn't uh, mention that uh, during my talk, but, uh, and maybe you guys uh, had already a discussion about it, but I think that um, the preparation of the case is of paramount importance. So, so there's no room for uh, improvisation. We uh, know exactly uh, the diameter of the origin of the target vessel, uh, the diameter at the level of the ceiling zone in the target vessel. We know exactly where the first division branch is positioned. So we have all this information uh, in the OR and the uh, appropriate uh, breathing stand have been selected. And I think if you uh, spend time on the workstation prior to performing the case, then you will probably not get into trouble during the case and you will have uh, uh, great outcomes. I, I, I would just like to stress what Stefan very briefly went over in, in his talk with regards to, to these uh, sort of main body graphs and the consequence for the mating stents that is to not confuse a four vessel fenestry to design for a juxtaparavenal aneurysm with a, with a four vessel design of anything for a thoracal abdominal. Different pathologies, different mating stents. And Stefan went elegantly through the gap between the fenestration and the wall and the you know, repercussions for use of bridging stents. And I think sometimes I hear questions regarding this, that there's confusion and maybe that's on our part, you know, where we've moved from these juxtarenal two vessel fenestrated designs to the four vessel designs and people then uh, confuse that with the thoracal abdominal. So, uh, which is not the same. Uh, in, in any aspect. I mean, with these four vessel designs, as you know, for, for post-operative complications, for everything else, it's a very different animal than when we do our thoracal abdominal repairs. And, it, and, and just to keep that in mind. Yeah, that's so and you, Tara, in the old days. Any other psycho message? Uh, for me, I, th I think I was going to say what Tim said, so that in the old days, we used to always think four vessel fenestrated is a juxtarenal and, uh, and use that as our nomenclature to, to change between uh, complex and, and non-complex. But um, in fact, we're, we have such a wide variety of ways to branch to vessels uh, that, uh, that it's really important to look at what you're doing when you're making your branch um, stent decisions. Um, and, and I agree with you. I think we've come a long way in terms of what branch stents we have, but there's still, um, I think there's still a bit of room for improvement. So I'm kind of excited about where branch stent technology is going. 
and uh, and what we're going to see in the future to make make all these lessons we learned um, make the stents even easier to put in. Now, I think we're being joined by Professor Verhoeven for some last thoughts. Um, Eric, can okay. Um, and so it, this is a good time to kind of gather together all of our um, final questions for Eric about the case, and especially his wealth of experience over the years of, uh, of all the different stent graphs he's used. Um, and here, here he is now. Hello, Professor. Hi, Eric. How are you? Are you talking to me. Ah, sorry, I, I, I just came in. I was waiting to be let in. Well, welcome back. Uh, we've we've been talking about you without you here. Um, any uh, any thoughts or, or comments you'd like to make on the case? Uh, anything you'd like to emphasize? Well, uh, we we played it safe, I think, by having an additional upper approach um, to have the safety of coming from above if needed. Uh, we didn't use it, we didn't need it in the end, but uh, I think it's better to have plan B on board than to feel sorry afterwards if you can't make it. Uh, otherwise, I think everything went about to plan and, um, and uh, demonstrate a little bit how we work as a team. Maybe that's far more important, uh, as you pointed out, that all the hands are well accorded and that everybody knows when to hold what and when to give which catheter, balloon, et cetera. Because that's, that's what makes the difference in this procedure when you have a, a couple of hands and a couple of brains accorded. Yes. Can I echo what um, Eric just said? Uh, because uh, prior to um, to having you back, uh, Eric, I was uh, saying exactly, I was trying to, to share my tech on message, which is, you have to plan your case. Uh, and um, what you just said is, um, well, the planning is also uh, to check what can go wrong. And so you need to have a plan A, a plan B, a plan C. And, and by having uh, this periodic catheter, you knew that uh, if getting access to that renal uh, was an issue uh, from below, uh, you had the opportunity to fix it uh, from above quite easily. And I think that that is very important uh, because if you spend uh, three or four hours struggling on one renal, it means that you have uh, large sheaves in, in, in both IDACs for hours and that the outcomes of this patient are, are, are going to be bad. So, But because you've planned it correctly, if it doesn't work one way, you're going to switch to another way and ultimately uh, um, uh, manage to get, to get a, a, a great result. And I think that is very important. And the second very important message of Eric here was the team approach because those uh, procedures require a lot of focus and sometimes it's difficult um, during a three, four hour case to, to, to have a, a, your eyes on all wires, fenestration, markers, everything. So you, and I was kind of uh, joking, but it was a half joke during the case saying, do they understand what's going on? Because I think it's very important to have at least two senior um, a physician scrubbed in that knows exactly what's going on. Because then at one point, uh, the pressure can be shared and, and people can, can switch. Yeah, and learning from shared experience actually um, shortens the learning curve for all of us. So scrubbing together is really important. Um, can I just yeah. add also I that, show I just wanted to add, I, I think Eric, you're downplaying that um, upper access a little bit for safety. I think for you guys, uh, your place where you, you mentioned you're doing six of these cases this week, it's probably a small step if you don't have the upper axis to tell anesthesia that we need upper axis free and arm. But in most places, that might be a bigger maneuver for the patient and for the team if you're not prepped for it. So I, I often say it's better to just have the upper axis ahead of time. If you don't use it, no big deal. But if you don't have it, you're probably going to postpone placing an upper axis for 45 to 60 minutes if you're not very experienced. So so I think that's a, a very good example of how you sort of prep, especially if you're not doing a lot of these cases to make sure of all eventualities beforehand. So I thought it was a very nice example of that. 
I agree. I'd like to show two poll results, if you don't mind. Um, the, the one poll about where are our audience is from, if, uh, if our Radcliffe team can, can show that, and just the breakdown of where the viewers are from today. And then I'm, I'm unfortunately the, we can't see it as well as you probably can. Um, and the other poll is what uh, fenestrated devices people are using. And I'll use that to just ask uh, our speakers, what do you think, um, do, do these Bentley graphs work in Jotec and Terumo equally as well? Have you had experience with those? Do you have any comments on um, using it in devices other than the Cook platform? Can, can you? Yes. Eric, Stefan, or Tim? If you want, uh, I, I was not sure uh, who you wanted to start this. Uh, well, you know, I've Go been ahead. a very uh, a true supporter of the Cook device since more than 20 years now, uh, having done my first fenestrated case in the year 2000. Uh, so, so I haven't used any other devices. And to be very honest, uh, uh, at the same time cautious, I haven't felt the need to use other devices. I realized that nowadays in the last years, there are a number of interesting other devices coming out and uh, they have to prove themselves. And, and I think it's mandatory to know your device perfectly. And I know the Cook devices uh, completely and uh, I'm very confident in using them. So at this moment, uh, I cannot answer your question positively because I haven't used the B-Graph or the B-Graph Plus and other devices at all. Okay, anyone else? So um, uh, I've, uh, you know, mostly obviously used Cook devices as well, but uh, we've placed a few um, inside devices from Jotec, the inner branch uh, off the shelf device and for that, we've uh, we've used uh, the B Graph Plus uh, as the bridging stent, and it's worked uh, just as well as in the Cook device. No difference. Very and solid. I've even that in... through. Sorry. Using a, a using a directional catheter as well, or a directional sheath. Yeah. So so I I use uh, you know I do the we do it from the groin, and we've used uh, both the 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 same that Stefan showed here the the APTA 16 French, but also eight and a half French steel sheath. We use one from there, uh, which, which, which handles the BGRAF Plus nicely. Uh, it's very good. I think there the BGRAF Plus with the inner branch devices where, where the aortic lumen sometimes is a little, little bit narrow, which is why you would use the device. The BGRAF Plus is very, very strong. And it's, it's actually cool to see on the follow-up scans of these patients, how, how patent those those visual and renal stents are in the setting of that device because they're so strong, but still flexible in the distal end. So yeah, that's, but very limited experience, just, just a few cases. Unfortunately, I don't have much to add because uh, like Eric, um, I've uh, so far uh, been limited to, uh, to cook devices. Um, um, like Tim, I, I have actually, I'm part of the, uh, the trial that is evaluating this, this new inner branch uh, uh, device, uh, but I didn't uh, so far uh, had the opportunity to use it. So I will be able to answer uh, that question uh, in the coming month, but uh, not yet. So, uh, and as uh, Eric was uh, stating, I think it's very important to, to really know uh, your device and know the pros and cons of the device and how to use it uh, in good and bad cases. And, uh, um, so, it, but it's also a good thing to have new devices coming on the market because I think uh, if there's competition, then we'll get better and better devices, and the R and D uh, uh, people will um, make sure that uh, uh, we get the uh, uh, the best platform uh, in the near future uh, available for everyone. Wonderful. When do you think the indications for Bentley in Europe will expand? Well, no doubt, uh, with the two studies that go on at this moment, uh, both the, the uh, FIVA study with the B-Graph and the BIVA study with the B-Graph Plus, we will have uh, uh, an official uh, on-label indication, as we already have for iliac, uh, femoral, and, and renal stenting. So 
it may be the first covered stand that, that has it all and, and provides it all. And in addition, as you very uh, correctly said, uh, Tara, uh, the multitude of diameters, but mainly lengths to choose from and uh, the six French compatibility are two assets uh, that are, are difficult to match. Uh, plus the logistics with Bentley providing us with stands whenever we need them. So these are, are great assets and, and they need to continue the good work. But I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased that this young and, and relatively small company that is growing fast has taken on these challenges. Yeah. And, and well, and Eric, I, thanks to one, your... Uh, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say, yeah, I agree that one of the major challenges was to get the uh, approval uh, as a bridging stand for French Renegraph. So it's actually a great move. And uh, thanks to uh, Eric and our German colleagues for running those uh, uh, prospective trials, evaluating uh, BGRAPH and BGRAPH Plus in FIVAR and, and, and BVAR, because we need that data. And I think we will all feel uh, more secure uh, to use uh, those stands uh, within the IFU and not uh, outside IFU. Definitely. Uh, definitely. Data is amazing. Uh, well, Eric, thanks to your uh, very speedy operating, we've actually drawn this session to a close uh, earlier than expected. So I'll, I'll ask for final comments from any of my co-chairs, if any of you have anything further to say. Um, uh, I think it's, it's not, great to, to, to see uh, the live case performed by Eric and, and his team and, and to be able uh, to, to discuss the stand having uh, both um, uh, expert discussion and the live case, the real life uh, case is, uh, is, is really nice. And uh, I hope that our colleagues uh, are, are convinced that those fenestry then the graph, if they're properly uh, planned and, and performed by experienced teams are associated with, uh, with great outcomes in the early and uh, uh, the long term. Yes. I yeah, so really uh, just a big congratulations, Eric. Well done. You made it a little bit too fast. We had to talk a lot, but as always, uh, excellent, uh, excellent, lots of fun and uh, good discussions, I think. Yeah, I definitely always learn something from you guys. All right. Well, thank you very much. Have a lovely morning for the rest of your morning, wherever you are. And, uh, and thank you to Radcliffe. And it has been a wonderful learning and, uh, and truly uh, my honor to chair a session with uh, such great experts. So have a lovely day. And uh, this is us signing off. Thank you. Thank you.